Engaging the Rural, lecturing at the Burn College of Art. This is Dr. Miriam de Burka. Particularly from the time I moved to Belfast in the late 90s, my art practice centred around the psychology of space, both urban and rural, how the imagined and tangible architecture of space can be imbued with meaning and how it can come to embody and symbolise our sense of belonging, our identity, our presence in the world. I found that for some, demarcating their territory according to access, in other words, who they gave and who they forbade entry to, provided them with a sense of security, that they had control over their lives, but also that this possession and ownership of space was something that validated a kind of existential purpose for them. I became interested in the legacy that follows when land is occupied in the name of an ideology or belief system that was constructed in order to justify morally the occupation of that land in the first place. I began with examining the delineations and demarcations, both physical and psychological, that Belfast was punctuated with, an archipelago of ideologically defined territories. I looked closely at the psychology of how we negotiate, a kind of space that continually sends out signals that you may or may not be welcome there, depending, and where the consequences of entering were an unknown potentially dangerous, or at least imagined to be so. I explored, or rather skirted, around the edges of spaces where you had no choice but to remain outside, because there was a wall you couldn't see through, or a fence that you couldn't climb over, telling you quite unambiguously that you were definitely not to enter. Then there were neighbourhoods where the architecture would almost push you away, subliminally telling you that you're not really welcome. Like where houses designed to have their yards facing the road, they seemed as if their backs were turned to you. And to find the front, you had to squeeze through a narrow gap between the houses or find a single exit entry road that led to what by then felt like a private enclosure so for a stranger like myself passing by, who was already a little reticent, being in unfamiliar territory, you didn't feel inclined to visit or walk through these spaces. And for those living there, this resulted in a kind of protection through isolation. At times I went anyway, feeling strangely protected by my camera, but it always felt uncomfortable, as if I was trespassing on what was technically a public street. I became more and more interested in how the claiming of space, power, dominance, control, how all of these things are expressed, how they manifest themselves in the landscape in less obvious as well as more explicit ways, and ultimately the existential instincts that drive them. When I moved to the Crum Estate, a roughly one and a half thousand acre colonial plantation dating back to the 1600s and situated along the Loch Urn in County Fermanagh, I experienced a direct flip side of the same coin of the territorial apportioning that went on in the urban streets of Belfast. Here, in the beautiful bucolic countryside of Fermanagh, it was not as obvious to the naked eye, but given enough time spent there, you soon discovered a deep undercurrent of the politics of space expressed in a rural context. There were ongoing preoccupations with who owned what field. There was an unspoken rule that farmers should never sell land to the other side. There were comparisons made between how many acres Protestant farmers owned compared to Catholic farmers, and the sometimes stark contrast in quality of land depending on who owned it, which was often connected to their cultural identity. There was the ongoing dilemma of whether or not a Catholic farmer should feed their cattle on Protestant ground or vice versa, in other words, lease from the other side and thereby give them business. <laughs> 
Or you would hear stories about how a Protestant who was hired by a Catholic charged more and did less in comparison to when they worked for their own kind. The list goes on, and the stories changed according to who you were talking to. Moving back to Galway, I soon became focused and possibly one of Ireland's most obscure, or should I say obscured, phenomena, the thousands of Kalini, or children's burial grounds that exist throughout the land, sometimes in very ordinary and innocuous places, like by our roadsides, under the foundations of holiday homes, in the corners of fields, on the shores of lakes, or the ocean, on borders between territories, up hillsides, down valleys, inside the circular dwellings of our ancients or among their dead. So by the time I came to teach at the Byrne College of Art, I had developed an interest in the multiple layers that we can't immediately see. Layers that can be lifted up and peered at underneath to explore how that social, political, physical and imaginary residue came to settle there. There are three broad themes that we interrogate during a semester, identity, experimentation and place. With each of these, I begin with uncovering the layers of meaning of the terms and some of the psychology that surrounds them. Then we look at artists that have investigated these themes or methods, exploring what kinds of possibilities there are for the students to test out in their own practice. What I am attempting to do is to amplify the students' awareness and draw attention to their assumptions, prompting them to examine themselves critically, to test out how far they are willing to move away from their comfort zones and step outside the familiar, and finally to get them to think deeply about what role they wish their art to play in the grander scheme of things. During my lectures, I tried to turn assumptions on their head a little, offering alternative ways of looking at perspectives that the students might take for granted. I feel it is very important to remember that things are often not as they seem. So changing the angle of observation repeatedly and always viewing their surroundings with a critical eye are vital to the artist's role in society. When I introduce the lecture on identity, I begin by speaking about the etymology of the word, to investigate where this idea of identity even comes from. In early Latin, identity comes from idem, meaning same, and the later Latin term identitas means quality of being identical. I take this idea of sameness and look at where our need for it originates. What lies behind that desire to belong and be similar and how this need can be potentially constructive, but also potentially destructive, depending on how it is expressed or demonstrated. I speak of the natural instinct we have to feel that we are in an environment that we know, filled with features and people that are familiar to us, so that we can gauge or predict our next move easily, and to feel we would have help at hand from others similar to us if danger were to arise. This makes perfect sense, of course. To see is to know, to know is to understand, to understand is to be better able to predict any eventualities. In other words, feel safer because you are better prepared. If knowledge eliminates or reduces our fear of potential dangers, then imagine what a city like Belfast, with its many visual barriers and blind spots, does to one's sense of well-being. The artists I introduce all make work that talks about their own perspective of having their identities, be they related to cultural origins, sexuality or gender, undermined by systemic erasure, rejection and oppression. I then go on to speak about how this intolerance of difference comes from that fear of the unknown and how the best defence in dealing with this is flexibility and openness as this leads to knowledge, which in turn engenders understanding. We can choose to see someone who is different as an other, or simply as another. Either we can't relate to them because they bear cultural hallmarks that don't resemble ours, 
or we can be curious about their perspective. And when we are, we invariably learn something which makes them no longer strange or strangers, thus eliminating or at least reducing that irrational fear of the unknown, or perhaps better put, what is not yet known. At this point, I ask the students to take the opportunity to view themselves from the position of being outside of their own cultural identity while they are in the burn, to look back across the Atlantic at their lives, to ask themselves what has informed and influenced it, to observe and to examine how they came to be who they are at this point, as artists and as people, objectively and critically, and see where that takes them. This removal from the familiar while being in the open expanse of the burn seems to have a profound personal effect on the students and how they think of themselves as artists. When approaching the subject of experimentation, I look at it in the context of risk-taking as a creative strategy. Once again, I begin by interrogating the meaning of the word. To experiment in Latin comes from experiri, which meant to try, to test, or to risk. But around the mid-14th century, to experiment was also considered to be a feat of magic or sorcery. This is something I keep coming back to with the students. The possibility of creating alchemy through the unpredictability of experimentation and the idea that the artist, her or himself, can be a medium into another reality, a parallel universe, offering a whole new layer of meaning to the often quite ordinary or everyday. I tell my students that if risk is a consequence of action taken in spite of uncertainty, then it is this taking of action in spite of the uncertainty that is crucial, the same way it is vital to take the risk of remaining open and flexible in spite of cultural difference. During my lecture representing land and place as metaphor, I show the students this image and simply say, here is a map of Europe, and I wait, allowing them their momentary confusion. We are given information by those who decided to look at the world a certain way. I stress that this is something very important to remember, that our expectations, assumptions and beliefs have essentially been shaped by someone's decision to present the world in a certain way. Despite the fact that they are wide open to all kinds of manipulation, maps have been used again and again as some kind of undeniable document. There are often strategic distortions, additions, and most crucially, omissions of information, contribute a substantial layer of influence to how attitudes and internal borders are formed, where we place ourselves in historical, cultural, and political terms, and how we see ourselves as distinguished from those in other delineated territories. We somehow seem to accept maps as being precise and true, graphic translations of the world, and when we find with our fingertip the place we identify with, they reassure us with a kind of visual affirmation that we have our very own place in this world, thus reinforcing our sense of existential belonging. I introduced the idea that maps can be used in art in powerful ways, often political, giving examples of a number of artists who use map making as a strategy, as a way to expose the many ulterior motives and influential powers that have often gone, gone undetected. I also give examples of the lies maps tell and explain that in order for a map to even exist, no matter how detailed, it can only ever be constructed on an assemblage of illusions. Once I have deconstructed map making, I suggest that landscapes themselves don't really exist, at least not until the word landscape or earlier landscape was first coined to describe a tract of land with distinguishing features in painting. In other words, Landscapes are a construct rather than an actual phenomenon or thing, a concept to which romantic idealism has been attached, often used for political and commercial ends. <laughs>
And then I show them ways to reread their surroundings according to habitat theory and landscape ecology. For example, a landscape pleases or displeases us depending on whether our reading of its arrangement of natural features appeals to our instinctive judgments or not. Judgments that on an unconscious level can rapidly discern if we may or may not be able to find safety from harm if need be. Our gut feeling towards what we are surveying will be determined accordingly. As artists, when understanding the psychology of how we move through and read our environment and the positive and negative feelings that it can engender in us, we can control better the responses we wish to invoke in the viewer. Ultimately, what I want to provoke in my teaching is something that I developed myself as an artist, an appetite for curiosity, to encourage an investigative practice that comes of an inquisitive, critical and open attitude. One that will make the student look at a given scenario and not be satisfied with the apparent. To want to find out more, find out what lies behind, underneath and in the peripheries of what is immediately there. To look for what is hidden and to bring it into view. Being in the Buren, the students are situated in a place that is lunar-like with its strange rock formations, low-lying, stony, yet almost fluid hills and large open expanses. Here the students have the luxury of space and time to think, to work, to explore. For many, the experience of being at the Byrne College becomes an internal exploration as much as an external adventure. And they often come away saying that they have learned to look at things differently on a personal level, but also in more critical theoretical ways too. I believe this comes out of their experience at the college, combined with the profound effect of being in the burn itself. Its stony undulations belie a palimpsest of geological, ecological, social and historical strata. Perhaps this is why it has such an impact on the students' experience. They soon realise how much more their environment can show them than would have initially met their eye. Thank you.